Thank you for joining our webinar, The New Rules of Incident Response, presented by Travis Rozick. At the, as the volume and sophistication of cyber attacks increase, so does the need to reevaluate your incident response plan. My name is Chelsea, and I will be moderating this webinar. Some housekeeping items before we begin. The webinar should last about an hour. We've left some time at the end for questions. Please type your questions in if you have them during or after the presentation. Please note this webinar will be recorded, and you will be sent a link to the recording after the presentation. With nearly 20 years of experience in the security industry, Travis is a highly accomplished cyber defense leader, having led several commercial and U.S. government programs. Prior to his role at Blue Vector, Travis held several leadership roles, including CTO at Tykin and federal CTO at FireEye, as well as senior roles at CloudHash Security, McAfee, and the Defense Information Systems Agency. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Travis. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe everybody should be able to see my slides now. Um, welcome this afternoon. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to, uh, uh, to listen to uh, the presentation here with Blue Vector and um, discussing the new rules of uh, incident response. I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump in. Appreciate the introduction, Chelsea. Uh, so why, why do we need new rules for incident response? As everyone is probably very well aware of or has seen in the news, TV or newspapers or uh, LinkedIn, the, you know, the cyber adversary is continuing to uh, grow and expand uh, internationally. The market for uh, criminals to uh, monetize this domain is very lucrative for them these days. And the way there's different safe havens around the world, um, physically, there's little risk in targeting this uh, attack vector and, and um, type of crime. It's, uh, it, it's a growing industry, uh, and it's definitely not slowing down anytime soon. So here's some metrics and some uh, references around the rapid increase in different types of threats. Ransomware, obviously, is, uh, has been in the news actually most recently as today with uh, some of the impacts it's going on with, uh, in Europe, uh, especially in uh, Ukraine. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a great way for the adversaries to monetize malware and basically holding you hostage uh, with ransomware and, and your company's systems and or critical files uh, and basically halting your business. Uh, so uh, the FBI estimates that ransomware scams has cost in the billions of dollars over the last couple of years, and, and those numbers are only going to increase in the future. So th this is starting to get a lot more attention, and it's actually impacting home users as well. So it, uh, it's a growing problem, pretty much an epidemic, I, I, would, I would say, and, you know, not understanding the threat, not understanding how to respond to threat and the different types of threats that are out there. And the impacts to your organization, and your business, and companies it is only going to make the, these costs continue to go up exponentially, and/or in many cases uh, cause a lack of uh, loss of life, or potentially cause your businesses to close due to un inability to uh, survive these types of attacks. Uh, you know, having a uh, robust incident response plan, knowing how to, to uh, minimize the impacts of, of a breach uh, when and if they occur, is critical to uh, minimizing impact and ensuring that your day-to-day -day operations and your your business and livelihood continues. As we all will are aware of key challenges uh, security teams face today, most security teams are inundated with uh, threat events, just detection events from intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, endpoint logs, uh, antivirus. A lot of the signature-based, the behavior-based technologies today generate uh, an exuberant amount of events and security teams are left to sift through the noise and try to find the needle in the haystack. So in the far left, there's just some metrics there that talk about from the, uh, the Ponymon Institute, uh, the cost of malware containment and the amount of time organizations spend looking at false positives and, and the potential costs to the business. You know, just some sample metrics and scale there, but uh, in, in some of my experiences in the past, I would say uh, when I was working in security operation centers, probably 95% of my time was spent looking and trying to triage events that ended up being false positive, which meant only 5% of my time was actually uh, investigating and writing reports about legitimate and actual events. And uh, not, not very rewarding, personally, you know, ha having to spend that much time looking at things that ended up being false positives. But the, uh, you know, basically uh, the, the lack of effectiveness in some of the tools and the context that was around those events essentially forced this brute force of attack to essentially data mine massive amounts of events and, and try to find the needle in my haystack, which obviously isn't proving to be very effective and it's very costly for uh, organizations today. Next, we have second category, uh, deciphering alerts. Just to give you some ideas, you know, 28% of alerts are deemed legitimate. I, I think, you know, just some other categories here from uh, Cisco's annual report to talk about amount of alerts that are generated across 
different technologies, and some of the spend is it's divvied up between product certifications and talent within uh, some organizations that, uh, in their study. Lastly, just talking about STEMs, so uh, security, incident, and event management consoles and, and platforms are predominantly where many of these systems generate events, and essentially the SIM is where that haystack exists, and it's up to them. Sometimes they get a bad rap because they're so inundated and it's hard for them to make sense across all these different data sets, and it, it, it's really difficult for them to do some of this correlation because of the wide range of data and the, sometimes the lack of contacts or lack of standards that's feeding these SIMs, the end customer to, to, uh, to operational lack. I would say, um, so uh, the new rules of incident response, rule number one, like any good self-aware organization or, or individual, it's always good to assess what your level of maturity is. The only way you can improve and, and grow and evolve is to understand your gap and be, be self-aware. So understanding the level of maturity of your organization, specifically around uh, incident response and incident response planning is, is critical. So, you know, following the CMM model, here are five different levels of maturity for, for an organization. So with respect to uh, an incident response plan, basically the most immature process, uh, really not having a process in place, that, that's going to incur the most amount of cost, the most amount of impact from a cyber event or incident. I, I would envision most organizations that are in level one will probably have some form of catastrophic loss and, you know, it will cost multiple millions of dollars to recover if they were uh, faced with that, that level. But, you know, knowing that you are a level one is, is good to be aware of so you can focus on systematically moving up, up the, uh, the chain uh, in maturity all the way to level five. Uh, level two, you know, organizations at least have some level of process documented so that, you know, some of the incident response steps are repeatable. That's, uh, that's definitely a critical step. I think, uh, so uh, level three is uh, further defining that process, uh, those processes are in place and making a part of the standard business process. So that's where you get into integrating the incident response plan with other business operations within your, your enterprise and making sure that everything is uh, synced. Uh, as you respond and mitigate and, no and notify the different organizations and understanding the impact. And a managed level, uh, obviously, to have success and have a way to measure your ability to do instant response properly, uh, you, you want to have a list of metrics that are critical to your organization, uh, and you want to have a way to track these over time so you can make enhancements and improvements across your organization as you respond to incidents uh, over over a period of time. So you, you, you don't want to be uh, rest on your laurels. You want to constantly be striving to improve, increase efficiency, increase speed, and ultimately that's going to reduce the amount of time to resolve an incident or breach, as well as reduce the, um, uh, the overall cost of the organization and, and brand reputation as well. So if you look at organizations like uh, Target, Home Depot, Sony, for example, they, they've had a lot of uh, issues with brand recognition as a result of some of these major breaches. And lastly, uh, the optimized approach. Uh, th this actually gets into where you leverage those metrics and you optimize the whole incident response process and you focus and spend cycle, cycles to invest in improving those, uh, those areas that need the most improvement. And, and that's the most mature process and organization that should strive to be in the optimized state. Uh, with respect to instant response planning. So rule number two, a dusty IR plans are a hacker's friend. So essentially what I mean by that is organizations that have an instant response plan, maybe been uh, dated and not rehearsed, practiced, tested, reviewed to make sure it's current, validated in any way, it is ultimately advantageous for a cyber adversary who ends up hacking or getting into your environment by not having uh, adequate and mature processes in place not having them rehearsed and having metrics to know, and just the, the just the turnover between organizations within companies, you know, not having that familiarity of, of who's who do you talk to, who do you reach out to in each business unit, uh, who needs to be involved. Uh, all those things uh, add delay in the response process, and every minute, every hour is critical to minimizing an, uh, an attacker's uh, footprint. So from an attack life cycle, cyber adversaries will try to get into your environment, they'll try to escalate privilege, and then at some point they're going to focus on getting a full foothold in your environment and ultimately try to blend in with your normal business operation. Once they get into that phase, they'll then either take some form of action in, in the network, whether that be destructive malware, ransomware, dealing intellectual property, and other types of you know theft or, or damage, depending on what their motive is. Or they may just sell access on the black market to somebody else who at any given time may want access to your system. So in this case, speed is, is critical to responding to them because you don't want to lose the adversary while they're trying to gain deeper footprint and foothold into your network. 
uh, as well as before they actually take some of those actions that are, could be very damaging to your, your organization. So, for example, um, things that should be included in the incident response plan. Obviously, there should be some type of escalation process. You know, the folks in your security operations center, they, sh they should have processes to vet when things become critical to the business. They should know which systems in your enterprise are business critical. And they should know value targets or things that potentially could be uh, uh, domain level compromises, for example, or business critical compromises. So they should have some type of escalation process. Also, knowing who to notify within a company and when the severity hits a certain standpoint uh, or threshold. You know, when do you wake up the CEO? When do you wake up the director? When does the board of directors need to be notified? When do you need to execute? If you have retainers in place with certain IR firms or other third-party advisors and staff, when do you when do you involve them? So having these things well lined out in a plan, an IR plan is definitely critical. And then, you know, lastly, when do you notify customers of, of any type of incident or breach or start adding in mitigations? So involving the IT team, the IT operations, or your desktop management team, those are all things you need to uh, take into account. As you formulate the plan, you know, build these around different attack vectors and different avenues of attack for your organization. So uh, one thing I always like to shed light on is most organizations, they tend to focus on being compliant and following all the compliance uh, rules with respect to security and, and other business components because predominantly that's what they're evaluated on. M most uh, organizations aren't necessarily valued or evaluated on being secure or other types of um, evaluation metrics or criteria because it, it's really difficult to, to validate or measure that you are secure from a metrics perspective. So everyone defaults to compliance as, you know, checking the box and that, that means they're secure. And that's definitely not the case. So one sad thing is compliance requirements uh, are not adaptive and they do not evolve. Uh, what we've seen over the years is uh, cyber threat actors uh, are very dynamic. And uh, these compliance requirements, uh, whether they be government driven or industry driven, are pretty stale. So for example, if, if your organization, compliance requirements tells you that your organization must have a fence two feet tall around uh, the perimeter. Every cyber adversary out there know that most organizations only implement what, what it takes to be compliant. And they know that there's a requirement for all these fences in the organization to be two feet tall. So they make sure that their tools and techniques allow them to jump two feet one inches, which is just enough to get over the fence of your organization and your security barrier. So I think rule number three from an instant response plan is to make sure that your organization is really focused on implementing security from an overall process perspective, can continually trying to improve and reduce the attack surface, as well as streamlining processes from security monitoring and responding, and constantly making sure that they're implementing technologies that are keeping pace with the evolution of cyber adversaries. Otherwise, relying on compliance requirements to protect your organization, we've seen over the last 10 plus years that has not been effective in keeping adversaries out. So just wanted to elaborate a little bit further on mapping out your attack vectors. From an incident response plan, you want to make sure that you have an idea of your, your enterprise. Obviously, the first question every organization should have an answer to and, and know is how many assets do I have? Where are they? Which ones are most important? Um, those should be some baseline questions that every organization should be able to answer. And sadly, that, that's not really an easy question to answer in most enterprises, especially the large ones or global. And you know, knowing to the next level what applications exist across the enterprise, what versions of those applications, you know, where which ones are vulnerable uh, or missing patches or uh, improperly configured due to business need would, would be the next level of maturity and, and criteria that organizations should have a, a handle on as well from having a, a solid incident response plan. The, the reason that's important is understanding your the potential attack vectors or things that an adversary could take control of from a secure a, a cyber defender. They should know where the weak, for some reason you can't, uh, you're unable to properly patch it and potentially it's a, uh, uh, you know, some business critical web application server that has a backend SQL server, uh, and for some reason it's vulnerable to um, SQL injection. Uh, you know, from a security and the maturity uh, perspective, the security teams monitoring your, your environment, it would be incredibly valuable and effective for them to know that these specific systems are vulnerable to SQL injections, and w when they're looking at the, the SIM or their um, security event, they'll know to pay more attention to uh, anything remotely looking like a SQL injection attack because your organization is definitely vulnerable to those based on, uh, you know, business needs that they can't mitigate those threats. So uh, this is a very simple example, but, you know, that's where coming into mapping your attack vectors and knowing knowing where you're weak and focusing your limited resources of people uh, and tools to uh, focus on where you actually are weak uh, is ultimately going to help reduce the time frame to 
the tax uh, diagnose an event and respond to it, uh, which ultimately will help the incident response plan be most effective and efficient within that environment. Another important thing too is test and analyze your uh, your processes. So uh, go through different drills, go through exercises to where you're actually making sure that you have people are watching those weak areas and, and validating that you know if something did happen, there was an event trigger. So for antivirus, they call them ICARs. You can do like a, a test string that flags an, an AV event, uh, just for an example. So if you set up your environment to have these high value targets, setting off some of those benign events that will, uh, you know, the AV industry will flag on, it will send it to the SIM, will help make sure that your teams and um, are actually responding and paying attention to those uh, those types of events on those critical systems. You know, it, it's just a good way to be proactive and uh, if you're constantly drilling and checking and holding people accountable to identify those types of activities on those critical systems, then, uh, you know, obviously when, when the real thing happens, they're going to be trained to keep uh, uh, ever vision looking for that. Uh, we, we talked about in the uh, uh, the maturity model, uh, being able to rate your IR uh, on success metrics. So uh, there's definitely several ways and metrics to collect. Some of these are going to be customized for each organization that's critical to businesses. It may have to do with business outage, business operations, uh, any kind of downtime, maybe the amount of notifications that have to occur internal, maybe notifications with uh, third-party incident response team, maybe notifications to customers. Those are all sample metrics that, that may be valuable for your organization. Uh, some other metrics I, I included here on the, on the, uh, the slide all revolve around time. So uh, time to detect. So from uh, an adversary sending in a spearfish or compromising a server, or sealing credentials, how, how long does your organization and the technologies and the people you have watching them take to detect that that malicious activity happened? And in the event that your organization is flooded with thousands or millions of events uh, across security products globally a day, you know, maybe the products detected it and, and um, prioritized it to some degree or correlated some of the data and said, hey, this is bad, but maybe your security team is short-staffed or uh, there's just so many that they may get overlooked. So the next metric on that front would be time to triage. So in the time that the detection actually occurred to the time your organization is actually able to say, hey, this is really a bad or major significant event that we must take it to the next level of response, that's what the time to triage is. Basically, you know, think of an emergency room visit. Uh, somebody comes in on the ambulance, the ER department has to do triage to figure out what type of care, what quality of care, and what time frame of care uh, must must happen. So I, I think in most organizations, that's probably the biggest challenge and struggle is that triage component. And how do they filter through all the noise? How do they find the needle in the haystack and, and validate that that is, you know, something critical? Uh, the, the next phase is time to coordinate. So with, and that can also be going in parallel with the triage piece as more evidence and data is uncovered that something is bad. And in the event of a uh, data exfiltration uh, type of an attack, it, you know, it's not destructive, so it's not causing any immediate downtime. So coordinating at that, that level isn't as critical as opposed to uh, uh, some type of destructive or, you know, destructive malware or ransomware when where it's constantly spreading and causing potentially permanent damage. Obviously, the time to coordinate at that phase is uh, even more critical. Talking to the different components of your organization, how do you get authorities across which business units take action? Uh, what are the different impacts? Typically, your IT operations team are involved, your network administrators, your security team, CISO, CIOs, potentially your uh, CEO, the board. Uh, the financial folks, obviously the general counsel, depending on the impact, and even the sales teams uh, that are forward-facing with all the uh, in-pro services as well. So there's a wide range of different folks you have to coordinate with um, and getting feedback from also help fine-tune and tailor what the response is going to be. The next metric is time to respond. And this one is always a little bit tricky because it's it's obviously very dependent on the organization and the situation uh, at hand. So sometimes the knee-jerk reaction is just to unplug a machine that you think is compromised and then the uh, incident has been remediated and, and it's over. So that's not always the case. I, I've seen a lot of times where a system has been identified as being compromised and it's pulled from the network. In some cases, the, uh, the adversary has been in the network for some time. That's a signal to them to know that they've been had. So that's a signal to them to, to go dark and to bury or find some, you know, to start using their um, their more stealthy covert communication path. In the situation, if, if you know the system was uh, just recently compromised uh, and they've only been in there for a few minutes, that usually is the best approach. But if you can't really ascertain how they got in or how long they've been in your network, it's best to probably take a little time to figure out potentially how bad the, the uh, compromise is. Do they have 
domain level credentials? Have they created legitimate accounts? Do they have VPN access into your environment? You know, what system do they have access to? You know, it's really important to figure out, you know, if you pull the plug or you remediate them from the network or access to this one machine that you know about, do they have potential footholds in other parts of your network that once you pull the plug, you lose all visibility to what kind of access they have in your network? So those are just some other things to consider and think about when you plan out your response. I've seen organizations that had other ways to get back into the network and they, um, you know, repeatedly had to do multiple incident response over and over again uh, because they actually didn't do a very well coordinated type of response or a very um, comprehensive uh, review looking for how bad was the compromise. And ultimately that caused tremendous amounts of financial impact and burned out their security and IT teams and you know, just wasn't good for business. Rule number six, so uh, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, so faster responses mean less impact and less cost. Obviously, the better your detection efficacy, the better the context uh, and the tools that you, uh, you have deployed in your environment, uh, the better and faster your, your teams can detect and diagnose what's happening in the environment, scoping the uh, impact of the potential incident. And then obviously, as the more mature your incident response plans, uh, the more well rehearsed and practiced they are, uh, the faster and more comprehensive and complete your response is going to be, thus obviously reducing the cost and the impacts across the organization. So uh, here's just a list of areas of focus within that incident response team and incident response plan. So having coordination across, you know, the different technical groups in, in the company, uh, you know, network clients, servers, applications, cloud assets, and then communication notification uh, across the different internal entities of the company as well as external facing to customers and then potentially to uh, third-party providers uh, who provide you support as well as possibly reaching out to law enforcement, uh, depending on the scale and the nature of the, uh, the incident. As with any type of incident, um, I, you know, uh, when it comes to cyber incidents and looking at root cause analysis, you know, how, when, and where, and sometimes the why are, are always critical uh, and always, always uh, questions that are asked from, you know, board and board level folks, uh, customers, everyone within the organization. So. In order to really answer these questions, it really depends on the amount of data you have, the quality of the data, the distance of the data. Think of some type of airline disaster or some other type of accident uh, where NTSB gets called in within the U.S. government. They, they essentially look and do root cause analysis to figure out, you know, why, where, when, how, uh, you know, what, what went wrong, what was the root cause of the, uh, the actual incident. In, in this case, it's a very similar type of approach trying to figure this out within the, uh, the, the cyber incident. So one thing I always try to do uh, going into an environment is have some level of assessment of their security posture, looking at if you have an idea of what system were potentially impacted, you know, looking at some type of a security review on the system, you know, were they implementing uh, security best practices, were they uh, properly configured, uh, et cetera. So that might give you a breadcrumb to say, hey, this system wasn't properly configured or is missing patches. Uh, that that could be your attack vector, and that might help kind of work backwards and figure out, well, if, if this system was exposed and we know the adversary was on it, you know, there's a good likelihood that this possibly what they, you know, this vulnerability or this misconfiguration is what they actually leverage to get access to the system. Knowing that can help you focus when you go back to look at logs or PCAP data or uh, anything like that, knowing what ports and protocols were potentially used, uh, as well as from a avenue of attack or mapping your terrain, knowing potentially how they got to that point. Uh, and then you can start looking and whittling down the needles in the haystack and start focusing on that potential attack vector and, and potentially find more clues to uh, further your investigation. Uh, and obviously, another thing that I've uh, encountered over the years is, you know, once you've done this type of analysis and identified, you know, the root cause and the attack vectors, uh, you know, was it a, a breakdown in the people, the process, or the organization? Um, and, and that's what was compromised uh, and leveraged by the adversary to be successful. Um, making sure that you, uh, from a policy perspective or technical uh, implementation or architecture perspective, whatever that mitigation or uh, the finding is, you go back and make sure and then validate also. So uh, address it technically or through policy or whatever the means is. But you also do some level of validation to make sure that whatever um, mitigation put in place is actually uh, effective. You know, I've been in places many times where, uh, you know, they, they thought it was fixed or mitigated, but what, what they put out there was a re-image an old system, an older version of it, and they thought it was fixed and it wasn't fixed and uh, it was just compromised, you know, a couple weeks later. That's always a good thing to uh, help make sure that once you you clean up the mess and validate that it actually is uh, 
has been remediated, and then systemically across the organization, making sure that you don't have the same type of problem anywhere else. On the last bullet here, the other aspect to um, why speed is so important uh, when you're uh, conducting innocent response uh, investigation, uh, the, the timeliness of these uh, event data and logs within network devices, so whether it be DHCP, uh, proxy logs, uh, firewall network logs, uh, router logs, you want to make sure that as you're tracing these breadcrumbs and walking backwards and trying to find the clues, uh, you do it in a timely manner before these systems are overwritten. So network devices generate massive amounts of data and logs. and uh, especially in large environments or large pipes, uh, they're typically overwritten pretty quick depending on the organization. So if you're responding within you know, minutes or hours or, or even a couple of days, uh, it's a very good likelihood all that data is gonna be there. And that data is very rich in trying to help identify the root cause of what happened. If you get to the point where, so based on one of the, uh, the latest mandate and trends report, you know, around six months timeframe between a breach to uh, a breach detection. And at that point in time, most of this data is not going to be uh, accessible. So conducting the incident response, trying to do the investigation and figure out what happened, most of that data is overwritten or doesn't exist. Or the adversary has gone in and overwritten those logs as well. They try to cover their track. The rule number eight, and this one is probably the most painful or tricky or confusing one, uh, re reporting the breach to authorities. Each state has their own breach notification laws and processes. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services out of the federal government has their own breach notification laws. So depending on your company, uh, depending on your uh, industry vertical, depending on uh, regulation, obviously depending on what country you're in, there's so many different policies, laws, regulations that determine when and who you notify about breaches. Obviously, there's no standards, there, it, it's, um, and it's changing. Uh, so, you know, it, it's pretty painful to keep up on those things. So um, that's definitely something that should be another, another reason to keep your IR plans current is uh, making sure you're keeping track of these laws and changes to make sure you, you have all your bases covered. But I, I also think that a, a majority of these have to do with disclosure of PII. And it doesn't really, you know, the breach notification doesn't have to do with the company being compromised or what level of trust or risk there is to that organization or entity. It, it only evolves around uh, medical or PII data being exposed. Over time, that's probably will probably evolve. You know, it's trivial for them to have uh, continuous access to the complexity of technologies advanced. You know, there's lots of ways that they can persist. Um, so, you know, e even if they didn't get access to any PII at any specific point in time that they were able to get in your network, you know, it's just a matter of time, most likely, before they would be able to access that kind of data if, if they so chose to. That concludes the, uh, the, the new steps from uh, Incident Response Plan and um, Teased IR. Uh, I just wanted to spend the next couple minutes and kind of give you a uh, high-level overview of Blue Vector and possible ways that uh, we can assist in, you know, some of those challenges of attack detection and uh, assisting in the uh, triage process that would help make your incident response plan more efficient and effective. So Blue Vector is a uh, network security monitoring and analytics platform. It leverages, it's been built over the last seven years. Uh, we, we've built these machine learning classifiers that don't require signature updates. So it's non-signature based detection capabilities that will analyze the static analysis of a file and then based on those characteristics from the static analysis, we'll then apply these machine learning classifiers that we've built over the last seven years and we'll determine if a specific file is uh, malicious or benign with very, uh, very good accuracy, you know, upwards of 99% uh, accuracy. So, uh, you know, whether it be Word document files, PDFs, uh, JavaScript, Android application, APK files, we have about 33 classifiers today that are constantly running in the appliance. So as files are coming into your enterprise or through email or web, there, you know, we have 100% com uh, completeness uh, of a review of, of these files, which is unique in the industry. W within the interface, with this kind of next-gen detection capability, we are providing context around the event automatically. So from, my, from an analyst or a SOC perspective, you know, we'll see these advanced threats coming in uh, or unknown threats that I've never seen before. Uh, and then we'll put context about web logs, HTTP logs, DNS logs, pre and post the actual event. So it can help do some of the root cause analysis and triage uh, to figure out you know, how they got in, what happened, what was impacted before uh, and after. And why this is uh, also important is it also from a staffing and, and HR, uh, HR perspective, it, it enables analysts who are, you know, not the most senior to be effective. So you get a junior analyst right out of school or college, and uh, you can sit them in front of the console, and, and they can essentially be pretty effective uh, w w within a couple of days. And they can handle some of the more routine type of detections and things that are triggered within our uh, machine learning approach. Then 
then it can help filter down a lot of the noise of, you know, the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of events coming into your environment. It can whittle down to say, hey, these are the top 10 or 15 things that are suspicious or malicious that maybe your more senior analysts need to go uh, take care of. And, um, you know, they can, they can better prioritize their time spending on the things that are probably going to impact your organization the most. Vector also integrates within the security ecosystem, whether it be endpoints and SIMs, uh, to help automate some of this workflow. Uh, so here's here's um, a couple of case studies, uh, or a case study with some different metrics with a, uh, a large Fortune 100 company, pre and post uh, Blue Vector. Uh, so they had an uh, incident response team of five people, and on average they spent about 20 hours uh, reviewing and doing the triage of each incident or event. Based on that metric, it ended up costing them. This is just in person hours, not impact to the business of damage or loss of IP. Uh, about $1,800 of um, a person hours of time. With leveraging uh, Blue Vector, they were able to do the same amount of work with one FTE, and they spent about four hours per incident. So um, right there was a 80% reduction in people as well as uh, effectiveness around the uh, amount of time to do the triage uh, and obviously speeding up the response cycle. So that was just the, uh, a case study that was conducted during a, uh, a POV that we had with uh, a, cu a customer uh, a couple months ago. And, um, you know, we, we conduct uh, POVs and uh, network threat assessments as part of our business as well, just to uh, uh, let customers and potential customers uh, try out the product. Uh, essentially, in a three-week process, you know, we, we can do the paperwork and get, get an appliance installed in your environment, uh, let it um, monitor your network. Uh, for a couple weeks, uh, uh, and, and it takes about 30 minutes to do the in install and setup. Granted, it's uh, off a spanner tap for it, but yeah, within a couple weeks of being in your network, yeah, getting some level of assurances that uh, you know what we see in the network, you know, from a network uh, threat assessment, uh, it can give you peace of mind that your uh, your environment is pretty secure. And/or if we identify something in your network, we can get a lot of context. You can actually uh, go in and remediate uh, in, in the, uh, a short order of time. So uh, that said, I, I, uh, I'm going to pass it over to Chelsea for Q&A and um, wanted to thank you for your time today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Travis. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in, so we'll go ahead and get started with those. But please feel free to type in your questions into the Q&A section if there are more as well. Um, Travis, I'll go ahead and get started with a question while, to give people a chance to do that. Um, in your experience, where do most companies fail in their IR plans? Um, so I, I would say in my experiences, the um, a couple biggest um, areas that they've um, they failed or had challenges with are, uh, uh, you know, not rehearsing the IR plan, not not involving all the key stakeholders. So um, obviously, large disconnects between. Uh, the different groups uh, that should be involved. So trying to identify, um, you know, uh, the person within, you know, the, the network administration team to get data out of to help do the investigation. You know, all that all that takes time. Uh, knowing who in the uh, on the customer side and when you start uh, mitigating and applying fixes to the enterprise, you know, notifying all the stakeholders um, and getting prior approvals to actually get access and, and make those changes. Um, I, I've seen a lot of times those things aren't really pre-coordinated pre or pre-planned or pre-authorized. So, um, you know, when uh, something like this happens and, uh, you know, it, it, it hits the fan, you know, there's, it, you know, due to, due to this, these plans and processes not being in place or having prior authorities, you know, most of the time it could take days or weeks to track down the right people, get the right, uh, sign off to actually start doing the technical work. Um, and, you know, that just uh, extends the amount of time you have to do uh, the instant response by, you know, weeks or months. So I, I would say that's probably the worst um, or the most common uh, uh, gap or issue I've seen today. All right, great, thank you. Um, and another question that we had come in is kind of based on that one, so I think it's a good leading question for this, is my company has a plan that, based on the rules you presented, wouldn't pass. Do you have any recommendations on how I might be able to appropriately raise the flag to get executive buy-in to build better plans? Uh, sure, yeah, that is a good question. I would say one good approach would be to um, 
uh, you know, personally or individually um, document some type of a tabletop exercise, um, kind of draft an example tabletop with a specific scenario that would be um, critical to that business uh, or industry and propose um, that tabletop uh, exercise as a, uh, you know, revolving around that incident uh, that could impact the business and maybe reference something that's currently impacting the world today. So uh, whether it be WannaCry or, uh, you know, some type of destructive malware, Shamoon, or, you know, anything that's been in the news recently, um, you know, generally has a lot of uh, C-level or board-level uh, attention, uh, and, and that might be the right, um, you know, motivating factor to get them to, to uh, consider and, and, and kind of take, take that uh, seriously. All right, great, thanks. Um, so another question is, I know that exercising IR plans is important. Who should do that testing? The team that creates it or a third party? And how frequently should that testing be done? So, um, so I'd say the answer depends. So um, uh, depending on the organization, sometimes they have third party auditors or assessors or, um, you know, whether that be pen testers or red teamers, um, you know, it, it probably carries more weight that, you know, some third party or independent entity is validating or conducting that type of a test um, or showing that there is an issue um, than the people who are actually writing the uh, the plan or trying to drive it internally. So, um, you know, just trying to find out who the right stakeholders are within the company, who, who cares and what matters most to them, uh, and then trying to identify, um, you know, you know, which third party or which group that, you know, really uh, they lean on or they trust or, um, I guess, you know, uh, drives what their responses are. So, um, you know, if if, uh, if if a third party company comes to do an audit, and and you know that individual always um, jumps on whatever findings are in that audit and uh, ensures the, the you know that those things are mitigated or fixed, um, that's probably the right entity to bring into the mix to actually get change. Uh, so you know, I, I think it's really case dependent on your organization, but trying to find out which which um, which entities um, are actually influential in the organization, and that's who you want to have help champion this process uh, in, in getting uh, validating those tests because it's going to carry more weight in, in the end. All right, thanks. Um, another question that we had is about um, some recent attacks that have taken place. Um, with a solid IR plan in place, how ready would a company be for finding malware like WannaCry or the new pet your ransomware from today? So, you know, um, it, it really depends on what technology they have in place. Um, so, you know, I, I can only speak to, from Blue Vector's standpoint. Uh, Blue Vector has a very, very good detection rate. I believe we uh, have been able to detect all the, uh, all those latest attacks, uh, even with, um, you know, a year old uh, classifiers. So even if, if, if these attacks would have happened six to 12 months ago, uh, we would have had, the organization would have had visibility, you know, our customers have had visibility back then. So I think, um, you know, making sure that organizations have technologies that um, give them a level of confidence that they're gonna detect these unknown threats that, where signatures don't exist yet, uh, you know, from an AV perspective, uh, I, I think is gonna help ensure the, uh, um, the speed and time to respond is, is as short as possible, and the impact is as minimal as possible. Um, you know, there's, and obviously, um, you know, technologies that have generate these types of events, you want to make sure that they, uh, um, you know, uh, are, are getting the, the right attention when they do get flagged. Um, so think about Target from a few years ago. Um, there were events generated. Uh, within the security team, uh, but it was kind of lost in all the noise of other events, and it was overlooked. Uh, and obviously, uh, Target ended up losing hundreds of millions of dollars as, as a result, um, just because it wasn't prioritized properly, and um, uh, you know the, the uh, incident response plan didn't account for that. So I think, you know, having the right technologies, and then obviously making them a key portion of the uh, incident response plan are, are both critical. 
Thanks. Um, kind of along the same line, what are the top three threats or types of threats that you think are driving this need for new rules and more evaluation of IR plans? So I, I would say the first one is, well, it, it, there's, there's, yeah, there's a few. So uh, the first one is, you know, there's been an evolution. So uh, with cyber criminals really getting into the um, in, in, into the cyber realm uh, uh, for monetary purposes, not just fame or uh, you know for uh, motives, uh, but for financial gain and reward. Uh, I mean, ransomware is just taking off. I mean, if it was a, uh, you know, uh, if it was, a, you know, a stock uh, and it was an industry and, you know, trading on Wall Street, it would be skyrocketing. Uh, just the rapid growth from year to year, um, you know, uh, so cybercrime now is uh, in, in kind of the Russian um, uh, crime gangs, uh, you know, it's, it's actually the top, you know, it surpassed drugs and other things within, you know, many of these countries around the world, but, you know, cybercrime is uh, kind of the, the the top money maker now globally uh, in in a lot of these crimes, and um, you know I, I think you know uh, you know cyber espionage has been going on for for years and decades, um, you know then with Operation Aurora and some of the things that uh, occurred within high tech companies uh, ten years ago, w when uh, state owned uh, companies were using the IP that was gained and gleaned from from these breaches to help them be more successful. Um, uh, but now it's 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 really about making a direct uh, monetary gains, and um, you know I I think you know uh, and that's obviously um, you know with ransomware it's encrypting the files and it's actually causing direct impact to business operations where that wasn't happening ten years ago, so they were just um, taking information and and they weren't really causing any impact to your business operations. Uh, at least immediately. Longer term, it could cause companies to go out of business uh, by, you know, not making them competitive, but there, there wasn't direct impact to, you know, people possibly losing lives in hospitals or power grids um, or, or things like that. So I would say the monetization aspect of it being criminal and the prevalence as well. So um, the, the other aspect I think that makes it scary is um, or alarming uh, is the, uh, the black market for cyber fools. Uh, as well as um, you know the, uh, the the leaking of some of the uh, U.S. government uh, developed capabilities that are you know have been released to the wild. So I, I think those two facets make you know what would typically be script kitties and pretty easy to detect in organizations. You know you're basically giving them you know military grade weapons, which I I think is definitely alarming. All right, great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Let's see, um, when you say a blue vector proof of concept takes two weeks, is that to train and learn in the environment? Uh, no. So, um, so there, there actually isn't any learning as, um, required for the uh, machine, uh, the AI machine learning portion of blue vector. Uh, it, it's already coming preloaded with uh, our classifiers that we've already built on the back end. Uh, over the last seven years. So the, the two weeks for the POV is just actually sitting in your network uh, doing the detections. Um, so, you know, it, it's basically um, monitoring your network for those two weeks and then, uh, you know, generating a report after the fact. All right. Well, thank you so much, Travis. Um, and thank you guys for attending the webinar. A recording of this webinar will be sent to you via email shortly. Thank you, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in. I appreciate it, Chelsea. Thanks.